Our last speaker before our lunch break is a 1974 graduate of Temple School of Law. He was the managing partner at Fenster and Barber from 1981 to 2008, where he specialized in plaintiff's, medic, plaintiff's personal injury, which included medical malpractice, automobile accidents, and insurance coverage issues. He is board certified civil trial attorney by the Florida Bar and the National Board of Trial Advocates. He served as the chairman of 17th Judicial District Court, Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals Nominating Commission. He is the past president of the Fort Lauderdale chapter of the American Board of Trial Advocates. He is a Florida Supreme Court certified mediator and approved arbitrator. He is now a mediator and arbitration arbitrator with Mediation Inc. and has mediated hundreds of cases since 2008. I've had the pleasure of working with our next speaker on uh, several cases. I participated in the intake of a, of a case and also the conference with an expert. Hearing our next speaker talk to this expert, it was quickly understood why he was considered and still is considered one of the best lawyers in South Florida and most effective lawyers in South Florida. So it's my pleasure to present to you our next speaker on the issue of mediation, Jesse Farmer. So it can show you that sometimes perception is different. 
But you need to spend a few minutes thinking, before you go to mediation, what are you going to say about liability? You'd be amazed at how I have people come in and start a mediation, and they'll start off with comparative negligence. They're already concerned, as, as, as Stuart was talking about this morning, they have things in the back of their mind they're afraid of, they're talking defensively. We need to make a sale. The first thing you need to do is you need to think, what is it I want to communicate? Because this is a great opportunity. You're speaking not just to the defense lawyer, you're typically talking to an adjuster, either in person or by phone. Think about what you're going to say about liability. Damages. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, but you need to prepare damages. If you're going to ask for $150,000, think about how you're going to get to $150,000. Don't go in there and wing it. You ought to have a plan for how you're going to get there. Comparative negligence. Um, I think that this is uh, something that you ought to address in your opening statement. You need to prepare for it. What are your thoughts about comparative negligence? Um, there are a lot of different techniques that you can do. Uh, in mediation, one of the things, I, I just recently mediated a case. It was a terrific case, and I won't tell you who the lawyer was or the local Miami lawyer. Um, husband and wife were inspectors. You know, now, ever since 9-11, they have these, these big containers that go overseas and have to be sealed in the back, and they actually have people that follow the container to the port. And they take a picture, maybe a little phone or something, and they, and they escort the container to the port. This was a husband and wife working together, and the wife was working, and she was actually taking a photo of the back of the truck. And this truck, this big semi, was, had been uh, moved about, I don't know, maybe 30 yards from the loading platform. And she went around the back, took her picture, and as you would imagine, she put her papers down on top of the loading platform. And she's taking her picture, she's writing in her report, and the truck backs up and crushes her. And she literally died in her husband's arms, because he was working with her, he was there, the truck backed up. And the defendants came in, and all they wanted to talk about was comparative negligence. And there are ways, and I was thinking to myself, this is a really pretty compelling case. Um, how often do you have a case where not only do you have a death, good injuries, you know, we don't have to worry about an IME, uh, and you have, the, you have a spouse, a long-term spouse, this was a 20-plus year marriage, dies in the arms of her husband. And all the defendants wanted to talk about was the fact that she should have turned around and looked while this truck was backing up. Now, this truck didn't have a, your golf cart back beeps when it backs up. We all know from wherever we live that the garbage truck, when it backs up, it beeps. This truck didn't beep. Semi didn't have a beeper. And their argument was, well, the brakes were released and the brakes were loud, and she should have heard the brakes and she should have turned around, and therefore there was a comparative negligence issue. And I sat there as a mediator and I was thinking through this, and finally I, I, I couldn't dissuade them of it. They were convinced that this was a comparative and other such case. So finally I said to them, when the brakes release, can the truck also go forward? And I got silence, just like I do now. And they finally had to admit yes, when the brakes released, it can go forward or backward. So I said, so the brakes releasing weren't going to tell this lady, she ought to turn around and look at, and see if this truck is coming. So then I told them, I want you to do something for me. I want you to write on a piece of paper. You don't have to share it with me or anybody else. I want you to assume that the judge has just thrown out comparative negligence on this case. There is no comparative negligence. You three defendants, there were three defendants in this case, are buying the farm. Now tell me how you're going to apportion liability among the three of you. There was a, an owner-operator, there was a leasee, there was a premises owner, there may have been a fourth defendant. So now I want you to divide up liability among the four of you and tell me what a fair debt, a fair verdict. And then I got blank stares. And the case did settle. It settled about a few days later. But I, I spent seven hours with them because they wanted to talk about how this lady was never. So think about it. And think about what you're going to say when you, when you prepare your case. Insurance coverage. Do you have limited coverage? Give this some thought. Go through your file. Know what the coverage is. Do you have competing claimants? A lot of insurance companies now, we have these small auto cases, if any of you do them, uh, they have, they'll throw in their $20,000 and there may be five claimants. You better figure out who the other claimants are and what their injuries are and where you are in the priority of claims. I did one of these the other day. Usually what I do, if there's four claimants and there's $20,000, I start at $5,000 each and then I ask them to tell me why they should get more or less. You ought to think about that too when you're preparing the case. I want to, I'll try to go quickly. Um, bankruptcy, foreclosure, and releases. How many of you have clients who are in foreclosure? Claimants. 
How many of you have clients that are in bankruptcy? These are all issues that affect your settlement. Where's the money going? Who's going to get it? Do you have the right to take the money? You have to prepare and you have to think about these kinds of issues. Preparation. Client orientation. Very important. You need to discuss the issues of mediation with your client in your office. Not on the telephone, not in the five minutes before the mediation starts. You need to orient them about all the issues that we just talked about. You need to let them know what's involved in the mediation. Similar verdicts and settlements. You know, clients have expectations. Sometimes they have tremendous expectations. Closing statement issues. Clients always want to know, what am I getting? What do I owe? What am I going to take away from this? Oh, great, you settled the case for $100,000. I'm walking out with thirty five. dollars What happened? Um, they want to know these things. Um, and the reason I talk about client orientation, I'll tell another Jeff Fenster story. He had a terrific case years ago, and he asked me at the end, he said, you know, this judge, oh, God, is giving me a hard time. I can't get the case settled. You try the case. So I walk into the, the uh, courtroom, and our client was working on a construction site. He was a young man in his late 20s, or early 30s, and a crane operator knocked over a block wall, fell on him, killed him, dead. Good case, right? Construction site, I got a crane operator, all sounds great. So we go into the courtroom, defense lawyer, experienced defense lawyer, very good lawyers. We pick a jury. Jury looks pretty good for the plan. So I'm feeling pretty good. We take a break. Defense lawyer and the adjuster, as I expected, started to come over to me. I think they had offered us 250 or something beforehand. And they say, we'd like to talk. Another good sign. I like it when we talk. Um, so I figured, OK, they made me an offer. And they offered, I think they doubled their offer to a half a million dollars. So our client, we typically, you know, when we tried cases, we didn't have the clients there for jury uh, selection. So I get the client on the phone, and I call them up, and I had hardly met the client. And the first thing out of the client's mouth is, I want $2.4 <laughs> $2.4 million. I said, that number's familiar to me. Well, we had done shadow juries. Anybody here done a jury simulation? Try to. Well, we had a very bad issue in our case. Uh, our young man lived at home with his mother, who was an emphysema patient. She had an oxygen tank everywhere she went. And he and she lived in the same house. Um, and he had a problem. You see, he used to beat up his mother. And the police had been called to the house three times to break up him beating up his mother. And the, of course, one of the issues in the case was could this come in? The judge ruled in my favor at the beginning of the trial. There were no convictions. And she then warned me and said, looked me right in the eye and said, if you paint him as a choir boy, all that's coming in. So she said, you better be careful about how you talk about him. And what my partner had done is he had tried the jury simulation, one with the evidence in and one with the evidence out. With the evidence out, he got a 2.4 million. With the evidence in, we of course got a very modest. He shared the jury simulation with the client. Not always a good thing, unless you explain to the client what that really means. So when I got the client on the phone, I said, well, I don't know what he told you about this, but there's a real chance in this case that all that stuff about your son beating you up is coming into evidence. And I said, that's not a really good thing. And I said, how many of you here in the room beat up your mother? That's what the jury's answer is going to be. And I said, so I had, to, I had a client expectation of $2.4 million. Now, I did get the case settled. But client expectations are very important. Some people like to keep client expectations low. I'm not a big believer in that. I think you should be honest with them. I think you should tell them the range of what cases like that are about. Very important. 